where we are live. Welcome back. This is the Education Committee in the Vermont House of Representatives, and we're continuing uh, testimony on S-16, an act relating to the creation of a task force on exclusionary uh, reform. And we are delighted to rel welcome Jay Diaz from the ACLU to uh, give us some, a response to that bill. What, are, what do you see as, do you, do you see, are you in support? Do you see problems, uh, unintended consequences? Um, anything that you would you would do to advise us on moving forward with the bill? Sure, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, for the record, my name is Jay Diaz. I'm senior staff attorney at the ACLU of Vermont. Um, for those of you who I haven't uh, had the pleasure of meeting before, I've been working on the issue of school discipline reform and um, uh, starting about in Vermont starting about eight years ago when I worked at Vermont Legal Aid representing low-income students and their families in a variety of education matters, um, uh, most frequently related to uh, when they were excluded from school uh, for long, long periods of time. So usually uh, from anywhere from a couple of weeks to months or, or a whole year um, for a variety of reasons. And so uh, I can talk about S-16 and I'm, I'm happy to do that. We are supportive of the bill. There may be a couple of tweaks that, that the committee uh, might want to consider, um, and I'll talk about those. But I also would like to ask, because I don't know how much um, you've already looked at the bill or, or heard some background on like where it's coming from, would you like to hear some about the, the reform conversation and, sure. and what the impacts are of school discipline more generally? Mm -hmm. That'd be great. All right, excellent. So I, I did provide um, just a simple fact sheet, uh, kind of just that I'll that I'll just go through, um, kind of summarizes some of my comments here. If you want to read along, uh, otherwise I'll just I'll just go through it. Um, you know, this conversation really got going uh, five years ago. Uh, we had a lot of discussion around exclusionary discipline reform uh, in in the Senate and in the House, and uh, I'm we're very pleased to see this bill being considered now. Um, you know, why do we want to reform school discipline laws or at least take a look at what's going on in uh, with exclusionary discipline across the state? Number one, and this is based on my experience representing students uh, and, and the many stories I've heard as well uh, from students and families directly, is that there are some real short-term negative impacts on kids. Um, you know, I think they're obvious, but we don't tend to like, we think of suspension, you know, uh, and, and school discipline as just, this is just how we do things, right? So we're really asking you to, we're really asking ourselves to rethink what it, what it means and like take another look at it because when kids are kicked out of school, they're missing valuable education time, obviously. They're, they're at home in all likelihood. So either their parents are missing work and perhaps even losing their jobs um, or being docked pay, uh, or the children are left at home unsupervised or, and perhaps unsafe. Um, children who receive free and reduced lunch at school, which is the vast majority of children who um, are subject to exclusionary discipline, are going without the meals that they would normally get at school. And finally, for the kids themselves, every time they are kicked out of school, uh, whether it's one day or five days or however, you know, up to a year is, the, is, is what the law permits. It only teaches that student, that young person, that school is where they don't belong. And I think that's an, a really important point to recognize because we've all been kids. So some of us have kids, you know, they want to belong. Um, and I think that's a, a, something that really gets lost uh, when kids are kicked out of school. There's also short-term costs, not just to the kids and, the, and families, but, but to our schools and communities. You know, schools with more suspensions are uh, rated on, on climate surveys as, being, as feeling less safe and having lower educational scores. Um, we're wasting resources it, it, when we kick kids out of school because obviously our school budgets um, don't change when uh, mid-year a student is removed from the school. 
uh, uns, you know, and, and again, we're leaving unsupervised, we're perhaps potentially leaving unsupervised children in the community where they um, uh, are a greater likelihood to um, uh, get into trouble, for lack of a better term, or be or be harmed themselves. So moving from the short-term costs to the long-term costs. The long-term neg negative effects on children have been well studied around the country and they're pretty clear at this point. Um, students who receive suspension, even just one time, are, are more likely to drop out of school, are more likely to end up in the juvenile justice system, and therefore more likely to be incarcerated or end up uh, in poverty long-term. Of course, this has long-term costs to Vermont's communities and our, and our economy. Our communities are less safe, less productive, less fiscally sound because, you know, uh, uh, some studies have shown that a high school dropout costs the state anywhere between 120 and 240 thousand um, dollars. The cost for a juvenile to, to well, it used to be if you have, you know, to but I think still to hold a juvenile in detention. Thankfully, uh, Woodside is now closed, but we're still holding some juveniles. You know, there's a that costs tens of thousands of dollars per year, and of course, the cost of an inmate in our prisons is over fifty thousand dollars a year. And so, you know, the way I recognized all this through my cases led me to craft the report. The report uh, that I drafted uh, at Vermont Legal Aid in 2015 was called "Kicked Out: uh, Unfair and Unequal Student Discipline in Vermont's Public Schools," and in that report, we listed, we had stories of, of students I had represented, uh, de-identified, of course. We had statistics from around the state that uh, we used, which is which with data from the federal uh, civil rights data collection. Uh, and we had, um, and, and we compiled that into looking at discipline rates across the state, looking at law enforcement referrals from schools across the states uh, and school-based arrests. So, and in that report, we came with came out with five findings, uh, and you'll see them here. You know, and this is this is going back a ways now, but um, I guess you know. So, some of the data is a, is a little bit old, but the data was confirmed as you know having some changes. But um, in 2016 and 2017, with the agency of education reports that I also included um, and sent to Jesse. But you know, now we haven't had data on this for five years. And that's a real concern, of course, because back then at least we had 8,000 school days lost in a single year by our students. We had students with learning disabilities. Um, those students on IEPs were nearly three times more likely to be suspended. Black and African-American students in Chittenden County and Abenaki students in Franklin County, the best data we could get at the time were two to three times more likely to be suspended. Uh, I know that in um, Burlington, where they did a robust data collection on school discipline, 90% of the kids that were suspended were uh, free and reduced lunch eligible. We don't know that number for the state, but uh, we know what it is now, but we know for also from the agency of education data report from 2016 and 17, that the numbers were similar. Um, but you know, our final finding here was that valuable data on school discipline actions across the state is largely unavailable and inaccessible. Uh, not just to advocates and, and people who, who work on these issues, but most importantly to the general public. And so we came out with four recommendations then. Uh, and in the report, they're more detailed but I'll leave them just with the, the top line recommendations here of limiting disciplinary exclusion, uh, allowing students to continue learning if possible during at least long-term suspensions and expulsions, um, you know, in, ensuring that students' rights are upheld and you know, finding positive examples and ensuring that we have accurate data collection uh, and reporting that we can use to hold our, ourselves accountable and ensure that we're making progress long-term. So I'll stop there for a moment before I move on to talk about S16 in, in case there are, if there are any questions. 
don't see any at the moment. We've had um, pretty uh, some pretty amazing um, testimony this morning. So I think we're sort of caught up on the statement of the problem and are now really looking at uh, the bill that is before us. Great. What it is that we need to do, what, what looks good, what needs to change. So if there's a way to target some of this to the bill would be most helpful to us at this point. Yeah, I, I did have a chance to watch some of the testimony from this morning. Um, from our perspective, S-16 is a positive step in the right direction. We get a task force um, made up of, you know, the important players by and large uh, in this work. And we get specific requirements and, uh, for recommendations and data collection. I think that is all really important. So the bill as a whole is, is, a, is a positive step. And, and we support it moving forward. A couple areas where changes might be considered. Um, from our perspective, having the secretary designate individuals from various, among of various entities, doesn't seem to make just a whole lot, just make a lot of sense. Um, typically when I've been involved in other task forces, the you know, a secretary or an agency head will have say in um, who they nominate. Of course, they're designating maybe a few nominees, a few designees. Um, but typically, you pick organizations to designate who is going to represent them. And in the list, it, we don't have a specific list of, you know, organizations. We have like a catch-all kind of phrase around. That's a good. That's a good catch. Yeah, usually we do have the the various you know, advocacy groups appointing someone. So we, I think that's definitely a good catch. Thank you. Great. Um, you know, and, and then, you know, I, I listened to some of the the data conversation uh, from this morning, and I think that you know some of the. Uh, what people from UVM were talking about, I think we wholeheartedly support that, you know, we, we, maybe this needs to be a little bit of a broader conversation. Of course, we don't want, you know, we don't want to go too broad because then you kind of um, get lost in the, you know, you, uh, lost in the, in the fog, so to speak. But um, when you're trying to look at a specific issue, but I agree that there is a real need to, to not just look at the negative aspects or just to look at the outcomes, but to also look at what is working and be able to talk about that. Um, you know, I, I, think the, I think it's kind of implicit that, the, that this task force will examine those things because the task force will be making recommendations on like what should be done um, or, uh, to, to the legislature, um, but that could be made more, uh, more explicit, of course. Um, we heard, um, I think it might have been UVM or it might have been the best program that, for example, in uh, districts that had, had, had implemented PBIS with fidelity, their numbers were lower. We didn't get to see how other things might have, might have played out there, but um, so, so what's working is a good question. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, having some analysis of that. I think would be would be useful. I'm sure the agency of education has some of that information. Yeah. And so you know, of course, uh, the ACLU's hope is that you know this group will will do this work. You know, it's time. It's very time limited. It's one year. Um, we'll do the work. We'll do it efficiently and effectively, and in a really meaningful way to move move the ball forward and give you all recommendations on what what. What does work? Um, what kind of data are we missing? What data do we have? You know, I mean, we may have a good amount and then we'll know. It's really not about the data we have. Uh, it's about how we present it. And that might be um, the crux of the issue. Our, my hope is that long-term we get a report similar to what the agency did in 2016 and 17 uh, on, a, on an actual basis. Exactly, yes. Uh, team, I, I just, I found this in my pile. This is from 2017. Um, it would have been nice for us to actually look at that, but I forgot that we had it. <laughs> I, I, I sent uh, the 2016 and 2017 reports that you just right. laid out. And 
and I think they, they are useful. I mean, they're really instructive because they are, uh, they do capture the issue and they show how the agency was able to get around some of the, you know, difficult aspects of, of privacy and um, uh, considerations, things like that. Um, not get around them, honor them by, you know, talking about just larger groups so that um, you don't have to be concerned with, with FERPA. Um, Aggregated data. Exactly, exactly. You can aggregate by supervisory union at a, at a, at a high level. So, um, so yeah, so I think that's most of what we have to say. We're very supportive of this. Um, again, we would say, you know, that the ACLU could be an organization on there, Vermont Legal Aid, Disability Rights Vermont. Um, I'm uh, sorry, I'm, I'm actually writing this down this time. Okay. <laughs> so um, you're saying ACLU, and Vermont Legal Aid. Oh, I would, you know, these are just optional suggestions. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the Vermont Family Network has done a lot of work in this area. Yeah. The, uh, I, I would think so, the best program folks at UVM yeah. might be, might want to be included. Um, I would add Disability Rights Vermont. And there, you know, there is a, a strong coalition working on issues of restorative justice and um, school discipline best practices that I think would would love to also have a seat at the table. Yeah. Uh, Amanda Garces is, is closely connected with them, so I'm sure she could connect you. Some of the and some of the there are a number of groups that have formed recently of you know, student led organizations around this, and I think it's vital that we do include uh, a measure of student voice on such a task force as well. Yes, we had a student present to our committee in 2018 on this topic. Terrific. Gone to some Ivy League school somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any questions? I see that we have um, Mr. Hoffer here, our auditor, to, in a minute. So, um, Representative uh, Austin. I'm just wondering if we could review the participants, the proposed participants, maybe at some point. Yeah. Just and just kind of to see what we, who's missing, and who should be. Included. I have that. I have that for markup. Great. Thank you. Jeff to know that for markup. Um, and Representative Conlon. Uh, same topic. I just was curious if, if you know, because we're getting into the area that we're not very good at, which is making lists of participants. Mm -hmm. um, and it, Jay, uh, you may have been involved with watching the Senate testimony, and were they fairly deliberate in the way they set this up to sort of keep the legislature out of prescribing exactly who would be on this committee or who would do the nominating? I don't know if you were, if you were part uh, yeah, of it, I, I, you were I, witnessing that. The Senate is a truly deliberative body. Uh, I don't know the, the I, I don't actually know what the thought process was there. Okay, thanks. Just Representative curious. Brady might have, might have seen it. I'm not sure, but but they, they did do it in an, in an unusual way. Usually, would we would have you know the superintendents you know or designee, and, and they would be appointing their own. They'd be recommending their own. Yeah, it was. It seemed so unusual that I was curious if it was a very deliberate move. That's usually our work. We're, we're more detailed. Tend to be more detailed. Um, anybody else? Thank you uh, very much. Um, I, I have made note of that. If you see anything else in here that you think needs to be tweaked, that would be great. We intend to do that on Tuesday, if not Friday. We might, might do it Friday, but uh, at least by Tuesday to start tweaking this bill, not tweaking, marking up this bill. Well, thank you very much for you. giving me the opportunity. And if you have any further questions or would like me to come back at any time, please do not hesitate to ask. Thank you. Thank you so much for your contribution. Greatly appreciated. Be well, all. Thank you for your work. Thank you. And we have our state auditor with us, um, Mr. Doug Hoffer. Welcome to the Education Committee. I think this is our first time in a committee together. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. And I might say, not only is it the first time, but in your honor, I'm wearing a tie for only the second time in the last year. <laughs> Thank you for that opportunity. Thank you. <laughs> I know you wear them and thank you. I, I, I want to keep up. Keep <laughs> Great. So thank, 
Uh, I don't know whether you've had a chance to read the reports, probably not, but I can summarize them very quickly and we can have a discussion if you like. That would be great. Okay. Uh, and I think the report is posted, isn't it? Does it get posted, Jesse, or not? I think she did uh, this afternoon uh, originally. Okay. Okay. But yes, please, please, um, please fill us in. Okay. Well, there were two, uh, well, three or four objectives initially. The first one was done much before the other, so we issued it as a separate report. There was no uh, meaning to that other than timing. We just wanted to get it out. The first one looked at the broad question of the extent to which statute and rule apply to public schools versus uh, approved independent schools. It took me a while to get that lingo. I, I keep saying private, but I know <laughs> I care for that. Um, but you know what I mean. And yes. In, in the end, we learned, as I'm sure you know, this is your world, your whole committee, that there are many more uh, requirements in statute and rule that apply to the public schools as opposed to the approved independent. Uh, but that varies by category. There's some overlap in some ways, and uh, in others, there's a big difference. And we put together uh, some tables in the first report, which show them, I love to say, they're side by each, uh, so you really get a sense of, of uh, which is covered by which rules and statutes. It's very helpful. In fact, the secretary was grateful for it because they had never done anything quite like that. Um, also, the secretary, as you know, is required by statute to supervise and direct the execution of the laws with regard to public schools, but there's nothing comparable for the approved independent schools. The primary oversight is uh, from the board itself after recommendations from the agency about approval. Once that's done, there is effectively no ongoing oversight except until the next time when that approval is removed. Um, the notable differences I think are not surprising uh, public schools have uh, very public processes, both for budget purposes and meetings and access to information, that sort of thing. And that's not typically the case for the approved independent school. And there were some differences that, that you can read about in detail in the report if you're not already familiar with them. Um, for example, one of them, uh, which I'll mention because we did a job on the child protection registry about a year and a half ago, which was new to me. It was really kind of interesting. And we did learn at that time that there were some public schools that did not meet their obligation uh, under the statute to ensure that people under consideration for hiring, whether they were teachers or staff or so forth, uh, were not on the registry. And the agency took that seriously, and I believe the schools will as well. But we didn't at that time look at uh, whether the approved independent schools do the same. Uh, and as it turns out, uh, there's reason to think they could improve their performance there as well. The, uh, the second report was more quantitative, and we were interested in the extent to which there was a trend, and if so, what does it tell us about both the number of students uh, either in or moving into uh, approved independent schools or the out-of-state schools versus what's happening in the public sector. And as I'm sure you know, in the last 10 years, there's been a bit of a decline in the public schools. Uh, we are all familiar with the demographics. But at the same time, public school enrollment, this is just K through 12, uh, declined by 12%. Uh, approved independent school enrollments went up by 8%. And I have no idea whether they're related. And we didn't look into that level of detail. It's kind of interesting. There are some interesting graphs in the report that will help bring that home. Uh, the other is that the second of the three objectives in the second report related to tuition. And uh, the rate and how that's determined and what's paid. And as you know well, and it was new to me, it's kind of interesting. Most of the approved independent schools charge the average uh, rate that the public schools uh, do. And uh, the differences are in not exclusively, but largely the four uh, meg, I would call them legacy, but the, the biggest and oldest uh, secondary schools in the state, if you know, Burn, Burn, and so forth. And the differences in some cases are, can be quite dramatic. Uh, on the other hand, um, there are some differences related to the, uh, the services provided by those secondary schools in, in terms of uh, technical uh, training and so forth. That's, that's all in the statute. And, and we didn't find any problems with that, with one minor exception. Um, in the end, uh, it does appear that uh, the difference in those rates across the board, it was about $3.6 million in 2019. Um, 
between had they paid only at the average tuition rate that most kids and the rate that they actually paid. And of course, all those were approved by voters. There's nothing unusual. It's all allowed by statute. Everything's fine by the book. Um, 3.6 doesn't sound like much uh, in the context of 1.6 billion or whatever the total is these days. But we just wanted to report that. I'm sorry, just to clarify that, you said in 2018, they paid 3.6 million total above the average. Correct. That was the total, total expense, okay. And most of that was secondary and not elementary. And what, was this attributed to the Ed Fund or not to the Ed Fund, do you know? It does go to the Ed Fund, yeah. Ed Fund, okay. Uh, also, we learned that the total uh, paid to uh, approved independent schools and out-of-state schools was just under $100 million, which is a fair bit of money. Um, you guys know better than I where this tuitioning thing started and where it's going, but it's really an interesting story. I, I, it's the first time I'd ever had any exposure to it. It's interesting stuff. Um, only one other, yeah, the, the question about the board's role, the board was not technically an auditee in this process, although uh, Linda, who I think is probably somewhere on this meeting, I did communicate with them on occasion. We also looked at the, the uh, their methodology and the extent to which they met their, their obligations uh, in advising the board in the board's role and approving these independent schools. And for the most part, it was fine. Uh, there were some uh, instances where uh, there were flaws. We've informed them about it. Changes have already in some cases been made and will be made going forward. The one that jumped out at us was kind of interesting and I, and I think it was uh, an artifact of some long ago decisions by in-house counsel and others that uh, to the extent to which the NEASC uh, provides information to the agency about an approved independent school that uh, it should be of interest to the board, and you probably would agree that it should be interest to the board, if it suggests that there's a problem at a school. And that's the kind of information that the board presumably would want to know about when they were in the process of reconsidering uh, re renewal or approval in the first instance. But we found uh, in one, in, in two instances, but one in particular where NEASC uh, initially indicated that there was a uh, some concern and that was filed at the agency, but not shared with the board. Subsequently, uh, that school was uh, identified as being under a warning. Yeah, had that in. But there was some concern, I think it was financial in, in nature. And the agency did not share that information with the board, which I thought was curious at best. Uh, and their response, we spoke to their attorney and, and this is prior to her tenure. So she uh, talking about something that happened in her policy uh, practice that happened initially long ago, they felt that the information provided by NES, NESC was confidential, or they were led to believe that it was confidential. And they weren't sure or felt uncomfortable sharing confidential information with the board. And I just thought, you know, remember in uh, the, uh, the movie, uh, I, I make movie references all too often, but it struck me as odd that the board should not be made aware of something so fundamental about the condition of an approved independent school. And uh, after posing the question to them, after what's the so-called exit meeting with them when we shared the draft of the report, the attorney went back, spoke with the secretary and others in the office, and they have agreed that in the future, they will in fact share that information with the board. And presumably, if someone, anyone, whether it's the school, or any ASC believes that it's confidential, then a determination can be made that if it's shared with the board, the board itself can't share it with the public, but can make use of that information in the course of their determination. And I'm grateful that they responded so promptly and, and in my view, appropriate. That seemed odd to me. Uh, other than that, uh, I think the agency, as you can see, if you get a chance to look at their management response to our report, we're very pleased with the work we did. We found it was useful, and uh, I think so too. I'm glad you guys have to work with this stuff and not us. <laughs> Are there any questions? It's interesting. We just had an independent school in, in today. Uh, Representative Conlon. Uh, 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 Doug, you just mentioned that the um, agency has a response to the report. Is that uh, where can we take a look at that? 
Forgive me, that is always appended to the report. It is in the report itself. Oh, it is, okay. Very short. Right, then I just outed, outed myself as not having read the report fully. <laughs> <laughs> You're not alone, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you. We, we do have thousands of pages of reports, but it is always helpful when one gets sort of brought into our focus. Well, that's why we give you a two page highlight. Yes, two page highlights. We're really good at that. <laughs> Executive summaries and conclusions. Okay, thank you. Oh, Representative Austin. Paul Linda was with us. Linda, do you have anything to add before they get to more questions? I I'm sorry, I, I missed that. I interrupted myself. What? <laughs> uh, Linda Lambert, who was the audit manager for this job. And oh, thank you. Yes. I just want to make sure she knows that if I miss something or she likes to add something to please do. Please do speak up. <laughs> uh, no, I, I don't have anything to add. Thank you, though. <laughs> OK, thank you. Um, Representative Austin. Yeah, just to clarify, who does have oversight over the health and safety of children in independent and private schools? The schools themselves. But the state has no role? I don't have that enormous side-by-side -side, uh, table in front of me. Linda, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe in the case of health and safety, that is specific to the schools. Am I right, Linda? You're muted. I'm sorry, yes, I had to demute. Um, I am looking that up right now. I believe, so safety and security requirements. So general, yes, it is uh, up to the school, but um, mostly it's the same requirements on the independent school as it is on the public schools. Yeah, Representative Austin, I can tell you, I was having never looked at this area in detail before, I was a little surprised at the extent to which local control is still primarily what's going on and the agency in response to many of our questions said, hey, that's not our job. It's a little concerning to me. We're local control. However, they are they are approved on a regular basis by it's either NIASC or Nietzsche. I think they've changed their names. Um, uh, right. Um, uh, NIASC is yeah. the accreditation uh, organization, and they um, approve or well, they relook at a school every ten years, right. um, and then schools also are required to submit periodic reports. Uh, Tindy ask addressing certain issues within that 10 year period. Vaccines, for example, the, the rules that we passed, the law we passed a few years ago, independent schools were required to follow those as well. Um, I think I saw right. James. I was just going to chime in about the accreditation process. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I know that the um, independent school rule is open right now, I believe. Um, the, the, uh, Act, the Act 173 advisory group is taking a look at that and making some recommendations to the State Board of Education. I think it's the 2200s or something, I'm not sure. Um, so that rule is open at the moment. By the way, to be clear, we did not look in detail at issues related to special ed, because we know that the statute requires major changes in a couple of years. So yeah. I should have left that aside. Yeah, I don't blame you. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. And I think that is it. If I don't see any more questions, and that will bring us to the end of our testimony today. I am gonna leave shortly. Um, to go down and meet with the Senate. Uh, just wanted to speak with the committee and thank you again so much, um, Mr. Hoffer, uh, Ms. Lambert. We appreciate you filling us in on this. We have to have our we have to have our radar up radar up on certain things, and this is one that we should be aware of. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, so, just looking at uh, the week coming up, um, we are looking our tomorrow. I will be out tomorrow. Um, you'll be in the good hands of uh, Representative Coopley and um, Conlon. And um, so tomorrow we'll be looking, picking up our, um, our miscellaneous ed bill from the Senate 115. Tomorrow looking at the wellness uh, issues, uh, the section of that bill. 
Uh, and then after floor, looking at the e-finance that we're planning to, to drop in at this point. Um, Jim Demare has draft has a new draft of the miscellaneous ed bill that's addressing some of the things that we've talked about. Um, adding something works and working uh, language for us on e-finance, adding some working language on Act One. <coughs> um, there's something else, wasn't there? Oh, there's also uh, it's put in a piece related to um, the State Board of Education. And that's something that has come up um, when the State Board of Education, uh, when, when this agency of education moved from being a Department of Education under the State Board of Education to an agency under the governor, there were some roles that were not uh, not updated as they should be. And so there was work done last year in the Senate. Um, so there was some negotiated agreement between the um, state board chair and the secretary. When it came to us, it appeared that, that there was not agreement around that. So um, Jim Demery has drafted some language to sort of look at that over the summer and come back. So that will be on our list as well. On that on that list, um, can you think of anything else, Representative Cooley or Conlon, that was on that list? Is that that it? Um, in addition to the other issues that are on there, so we're going to be uh, marking that up. Also, S sixteen, we're going to be marking that up. It's my hope that we can pass one sixteen out of committee uh, next week. So. Um, and I'm going to look to uh, Representative Brady for her guidance on, on areas that, that there was a, a tremendous amount of information that I, quite frankly, have not figured out where it all fits in our bill. Um, and I, I know that they've sent some information. So uh, if you wouldn't mind, uh, actually, Representative Brady, maybe reaching out to some of those people and saying, give us some specifics. <laughs> give us specific language. We're at a concrete level now. We're, 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 we're not at the big concepts, we're at the concrete language, um, I think would be helpful. And uh, the same thing with the other aspects. I think um, Representative Brown was working on, on libraries. I libraries. think maybe there's a week or two that we might wanna talk about. The language is still in the bill as it came over. And we'll, we'll do a little walkthrough on that. And Representative Brown will be looking to you for areas where you might have seen um, an, a tweak or in testimony that maybe made some recommendations. Um, uh, wellness, we're going to have more testimony tomorrow, I think. Tomorrow, yes. So, tomorrow. Um, and wellness, and, um, I think Representative Austin, you are going to be so, so right down. Uh, some some things that we might want to want to discuss that 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 we would be addressing, um, and um, the the Act One is is a little tricky. That's going to be I'm not sure what we're going to do there yet. I, I don't have a picture of what we're going to do. I'm certainly open to conversation about that. We've just left in the language to add the people right now. That's the only thing that's there at the moment. Um, we're, we'll, there'll be room to discuss that. Okay, um, so I'm going to do questions for a minute, and then I'm going to run out, and you can continue to to talk. Um, and please text me if I need to come back and straighten things out. <laughs> Why would you have to do that, Madam Chair? <laughs> um, Representative Austin. Yeah. Um, I was not going to say I'm really conflicted by the e finance issue. You know what, instead of talking about that right now, because I have to leave, and if there are some issues, would you uh, work on that? We're going to bring that up again on okay. Tuesday, um, and maybe you could work with Representative Conlon, who's going to be taking that part. I'm, I'm sorry to, to, to be abrupt. That's okay. That's all right. yeah. and, and, and it's on the agenda for tomorrow. It's on the agenda. Oh, yes. There we go. So that'll be the time to be addressing that. Great. Okay. Thank you. And is there anything else then? So I'm going to be looking when we get to miscellaneous ed dev folks. Um, uh, we'll, we'll sort of divide that one up on who's going to who's going to do what. 
Coop, I'm, I mean, uh, Representative Tooth, I'm looking for something you might want to do. Of course, we have some ideas. Um, <laughs> but uh, okay, you, you, can, you can look over what's left in terms of what's left of those bills, of those items in, in S-115. And then we're going to also be taking up the waiting study. So that's why next week I'd really like to get one, get 16 out of here. I'd like to have uh, 115 pretty well ready to go. And then we're going to be basically on getting those to the floor and um, waiting study. And the waiting study, we will work with that. And then it will go to Ways and Means and probably appropriations. So we're going to be now uh, closing in. Pretty focused. <clears throat> focused. And we might just vote these stuff out tomorrow. Just, yeah. There's a good possibility that could happen. Good possibility. Excellent. Of course, we have not warned it, but that's okay. <laughs> who, follow, who follows the rules anyway? I do know that here's one thing I did learn that happened one year. Um, you can't, when the chair is not there, you can't pull a bill off the wall and pass it. <laughs> <laughs> that was done. <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was a result of that. that they, they can't do we don't that. necessarily have to pass any bills, but we can have discussion oh, on Oh, it. absolutely. You can, you can, of course, you can do that. You just can't pull it off the wall and pass it. <laughs> oh, I would certainly have no intention of doing that. There's a, there's a good story for that. <laughs> yeah, there is. Okay, so with that, I'm going to leave, and, and I, I'm going to... Uh, I, will I think we're, oh. we're pretty well done. Should we, uh, Jesse, should we go offline? I think we are. Yeah. No, we're not. No, we're, we're not. Live. We're, oh. So we're, yeah.